Welcome everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started in 10 minutes. Welcome everyone. We're going to start in nine minutes. Welcome everyone. We're going to get started in eight minutes. Welcome everyone. We're going to get started in seven minutes. Welcome everyone. We're going to get started in six minutes. Welcome everybody. We're going to get started in five minutes.
Welcome everybody. We're gonna get started in four minutes. Welcome everyone. We're gonna get started in three minutes. Welcome everyone. We're gonna get started in two minutes. Welcome everyone. We're gonna get started in one minute. Hello and welcome to ATARC's Understanding and Planning for Fishing Resistant MFA webinar. My name is Kirsten Patton and I will be moderating today's panel discussion. ATARC stands for the Advanced Technology Academic Research Center and we are a nonprofit that facilitates collaboration between government, industry and academia in order to accelerate technology modernization initiatives. We provide ongoing opportunities for cross-agency collaboration through on-site interaction, learning, and market research. I would like to thank our partners over at Ubico today for helping us put together today's session. And additionally, I would like to thank you all who are joining us today. We hope that you enjoy this informative session. And I would also like to remind you that we love to be interactive. So please send in any questions that you may have for our panelists as they come up throughout today's discussion. 
as well as answer the, the poll questions that come up in order to ensure that you receive your CPE credit. And with that, I would like to welcome our attendees to please come on camera and come off mute. And we will begin with a round of introductions. So share with us who you are, what you do, what agency or organization you're representing, and anything else you think may be of interest to our audience today. Let's start it off with Derek, please. Hi, thanks, Kirsten. Appreciate it. Hi, I'm uh, Derek Mueller. I'm with uh, CISA. I'm a uh, cybersecurity advisor, cyber state coordinator for Pennsylvania, and uh, my roles uh, encompass a, a lot of areas uh, on the uh, critical infrastructure side. And I'll just look forward to uh, learning from the rest of the panelists and uh, uh, deep diving into uh, what topics we're talking about today for uh, phishing resistant multi factor authentication and some of the uh, regs that have just come out. Fantastic. I'm going to pass it over then to Eric next. Sure. Uh, hi, I'm Eric Mill. I work for the White House Office of Management and Budget, um, which is the part of the White House that deals with uh, federal agency operations and technology and cybersecurity. So I, I work for the Federal Chief Information Officer as part of that, and uh, I focus on uh, zero trust as well as other cybersecurity and technology issues. Thank you, Eric. All right, let's hear from Grant next. Yeah, so I'm Grant Dasher. Um, I also work at uh, CISA. Um, I work in the cybersecurity division of CISA on uh, lots of things around identity, um, you know, for agencies and, and for other uh, stakeholders of CISA. So I provide, you know, technical advice and, 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 you know, help with policy setting and things like that. Fantastic. And then Jared, of course. Great. Thank you. My name is Jared Chong. I'm the Chief Solutions Officer. If you call me, some of you may know we'd rather make this as a YubiKey. Uh, but more importantly, we um, we at Yubico co-created the FIDO Open Standard back in 2013, so quite some time ago. And uh, we're really excited to see the adoption accelerate in the industry, but even more excited that uh, this Open Standard being embraced by the federal government, particularly with Eric's team and, and Grant and CISA. So really here to share any knowledge on how agencies can adopt the technology, what's, uh, what's in it for them. Uh, but uh, we're really excited that, that FIDO is really given and picking up here all over the world. Excellent. Thank you all so much. So we're really lucky to have uh, OMB represented here today, actually, because that leads me to my first question, which is around the OMB M2206 mandate and the use of phishing resistant MFA solutions as part of the zero trust strategy. So Eric, maybe we can start with you and give us some clear clarity around what is your definition of phishing resistant MFA and what is the gold standard that we should all be looking towards? Sure, and um, I'm ha also happy to share this here with uh, with Grant if you wanna add any color. Um, so we're, uh, so yeah, for background, right, for, for those not familiar, um, our office, which, which issues policy for federal agencies, um, issued a federal zero trust strategy at the top of this year, after a public comment phase around a draft last year, um, one of the main, so that's uh, an OMB memorandum language that's numbered uh, M2209, but um, it is, you know, our, our, it's our zero trust strategy. And part of that is around uh, uh, phishing resistant multi-factor authentication. And so what we are, you know, that's really designed as it says, right? The, a subset of multi-factor authentication approaches that specifically is able to block phishing in the way that it is practiced today. Um, and so you know, it is unfortunately um, a little common today for multi-factor authentication of some sorts that are not phishing resistant to be bypassed, right? So um, if somebody sets up a, a fake website that impersonates a government website that requires multi-factor authentication, um, and they are successfully able to fool the user into coming in and entering their username and password into a phishing site, they're likely also going to be able to fool the user into entering their TOTP code off of their Google Authenticator app or whatever code they get into their text message. The user believes they're interacting with the real site and the phishing site can take that, can take both codes, both the password and the second factor code and just use those to go and log in as the, on the user's behalf fraudulently to the real thing. Um, so that is a, that's a, a growing threat and a real thing that we see and that is seen all throughout the, the industry. 
Um, and so we are focused on uh, making sure that when the federal government implements MFA, particularly for its staff, for its, the way it does business and the way that staff come and use services inside of federal agencies, that they are using methods that, that, can, that are, are technically constrained from falling victim to that, where the user can't be fooled into being fished, even if the user doesn't know what's going on. Right? Um, so uh, in terms of gold standards for how that works, um, basically the, you know, any kind of method that, appro that, that is able to do this is gonna rely on fancy cryptography under the hood somehow in order to, to create some kind of stronger binding uh, between the real site and the user's real multi-factor method that can't be messed with by somebody in the middle like that. So um, in the federal government, we uh, for a long time have had a standard called PIV, personal identity verification, that is typically practiced, not exclusively, but typically through the cards that uh, staff are issued when they begin work in the federal government. And those have certificates inside them that can be used for authentication, and do provide that phishing resistance. Um, that, that's, there's not a way for a phishing site to take the interaction with that PIV card and use it to log into something else. Um, the other thing, of course, which I'm sure we'll talk about here a fair amount is FIDO, uh, is the, 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 the set of FIDO standards with, um, and on the web, that's web authentication is the, the web standard for how that works for websites. Um, these are these are standards that are, are based around some of the same principles where there is a cryptography where when you take a a UB key or another kind of token or even a laptop or phone and you are registering that as your multi-factor method that there's there's a cryptographic understanding that is then uh prevents you from being fooled into logging in with that same thing to another thing so i'll i'll stop there but that's how we think about it yeah let me add a few few additional things to situate this with respect to you know how the government has traditionally talked about this because I know a number of members of our audience are 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 you know long long time civil servants and government employees. So as you all know, or many of you know, um, you know NIST has issued a series of documents called the Digital Identity Guidelines over the previous you know number of years, um, and the current version of those guidelines has a set of concepts in them called um, identity assurance levels and authenticator assurance levels or IAL and AAL. Um, you know, previously there was a single concept, you know, level of assurance, LOA, that sort of combined these things and some other things together, but that's been broken apart in the current version of the standard. Um, and what we're talking about today is really that AAL piece. So NIST, you know, broke it into three types, AAL1, 2, and 3. So AAL1 was a password. AAL2 was essentially an MFA authentication. And AAL3 had two properties associated with it. One was um, this idea that it has to be a hardware bound uh, credential, like a, like a physical token with some sort of separate cryptographic module in it, or some sort of separate um, you know, module in it. And then the second was this property called verifier impersonation resistance, which is similar, but not exactly the same as this new property phishing resistance that is defined in M2209. Um, so what we are doing here um, is, you know, OMB has gotten a little bit ahead of, of the digital identity guidelines, um, but we've worked very closely with NIST in the drafting of this. And these things are going to converge with each other again as NIST, you know, publishes the updated version of 863, the next version of the guidelines. And what they've said publicly um, on these panels and, and to agencies is this definition of phishing resistance that's in M2209 is going to be more or less the definition in the next version of 863. And um, the government requirement, which was previously um, AAL2 for all you know, inf internal like contractor systems is being up-leveled to this new requirement, which is phishing resistant authentication, which takes sort of one of these higher level properties and pulls it down into the broad requirement. So obviously PIV meets this requirement, but as does FIDO. And in fact, the distinction in terms of the strength of like a PIV card versus a FIDO card as an authentication factor, um, you know, we the current policy from OMB and the future revisions of 863 will treat those as equivalent but, uh, from a security point of view. So 
Um, same same message as Eric, but just sort of situated within the context of these other documents that are floating out there. And I know it's a little confusing because like the digital identity guidelines get updated on a very sort of um, particular cycle, um, but this will all converge with itself again. It's just sort of confusing right now. Thank you too for responding to that question. So my next question then, and go ahead and come off mute if you'd like to respond to this, but how important is it for federal agencies to implement phishing resistant MFA based on PIV and FIDO authentication industry standards versus propri proprietary vendor specific protocols? So I'm happy to go first there. Um, I mean, you know, you heard in our in our intro, both Grant and I, you know, we, we talked about FIDO, we talked about PIV, we weren't really talking about proprietary vendor specific protocols. And, um, and though certainly there are other ways to go about creating that, you know, a cryptographic binding that can give you phishing resistance, um, we're not really in a situation where we have to rely on those things. We, you know, as Jared sort of implied at the beginning, the FIDO standards have been around in one form or another, they've been evolving, but they have been developed for almost a decade now. Um, and, uh, and, and they're developed and, and contributed to by the companies that make all of the major platforms that you would care to name and that you would see in an enterprise environment that human beings would be using. Um, so, uh, you know, we're, we're, that's a good situation to be in, right? So we, we, we are able to point to something that we know is widely invested in, used in both the consumer and enterprise contexts, which is also really important. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, we, we have been really encouraging folks, you know, and that's why we're also willing in M2209 to call out FIDO and web authentication directly. Right? This, this really is, um, you know, the, the direction alongside PIV that we would expect to see agencies going in, just as a matter of practice. Thank you. Would any of our other panelists like to respond to that or add anything additional based on Eric's response? Jared, please go ahead. Yeah, I'll add to what Eric said. So from a scale perspective, what's the gateway to or how we work in the cloud internet, right? Did you trust that to very few platform vendors, like literally three, right? Microsoft with the Windows, Google with the Android. Uh, and then Apple with, with iOS um, and Mac Sorry, OS. Jared, I don't mean to interrupt, but unfortunately yeah. your audio is actually, is, is pretty rough. There's some feedback going on. Oh, sorry. Um, is it better now? Um, no. Not really. <laughs> okay, uh, let me, uh, let's continue on. I'll, I'll come back. Okay. okay, thank you, Jared. We'll hear from you when you come back then. Um, okay, I'm gonna pop up our first poll question then, but if there is any additional comment, and our parents like to make the floor is all yours, but otherwise we'll go ahead and put up our first poll question, please. And it will be up momentarily. There we go. Okay, if you're at home, what phishing resistant MFA solutions are you implementing or plan to implement for PIV or non-PIV eligible workers? So please respond to the options, which include PIV and derived PIV, FIDO, PIV and FIDO or other. And we will give Jared a moment to come back here. Jared, can you hear us yet? Yes, is it better now? Oh, much better, yes. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, all good. Thank you, Eric, for saying something. I wasn't sure if it was just me, but yeah, go ahead. Jared. Thanks, Eric. And so what I was mentioning about is that the gateway to the internet really falls into three major platform vendors, Microsoft being Windows, Google, Android, Apple being iOS, Mac OS, and really, since 2019, all three platform vendors have made FIDO part of their everyday product line, right? So Safari shipping with it, Chrome, uh, Microsoft Edge, and, and even the platform themselves. And being able to support security keys like YubiKey or platform authenticators as part of the platform. So the, FIDO is a mature standard and it's continuing to evolve to introduce additional use cases. And it just makes sense to invest in an industry standard backed by these three tech giants uh, and trying to do something else that is not uh, this open standard would run into other challenges in terms of longevity. 
Excellent. Thank you, Jared. Excellent points. Okay, so Derek, I would love to hear from you next. What are the authentication gaps across the federal government that require phishing resistant authentication that you could speak to? On the federal government side, I'll even talk federal government and uh, on the uh, critical infrastructure side and private sector. Uh, there's a lot. Uh, I know a lot of places aren't there yet. Uh, you know, a lot of authentication on the uh, on the DoD side, you you'll have like your basic uh, PIV or, or CAC or your token card to log in. Uh, industry side, you'll see a lot that have uh, you know most of it's user ID and password. Some of them are going token based, but they don't really have uh, phishing resistant MFA in place yet. Um, I've seen huge gaps in mobile uh, technology. Uh, and I think uh, if I've read uh, correctly before, I think YubiKey is uh, is one of the factors. I think uh, Yubico is working on that uh, from what I've read before. I may be wrong, uh, but Jared can chime in on that. Uh, you think about with uh, COVID and everything, remote access. Think about remote access. Not a lot of multi-factor authentication in place there. And um, I guess on the administration side, you see folks with uh, privileged user access. There really is no multi-factor authentication uh, once you get actually into the systems uh, side of administration. Um, that's lacking, definitely. Um, and I guess another huge part, if you think of all throughout the country and world, is uh, legacy systems. A lot of legacy systems out there that can't handle multi-factor authentication. And uh, so we definitely see a lot of that. Um, but really just following, uh, you know, your risk management process procedures and going down to, you know, your critical assets uh, to your less critical and uh, trying to see how you know, phishing resistant uh, multi-factor authentication can be implemented or not. And uh, I guess the uh, favorite saying of, uh, of uh, CISA is uh, more than more than a password. It's, uh, you know, you got to think of it that way. Instead of just your basic password, you got to think of multi-factor authentication. And then you got to think of phishing resistant uh, multi-factor authentication in those regards. Thanks, Derek. And Jared, I think Derek kind of set you up to respond to that question as well. I, I, you know, for agencies, I think it's a journey. I don't think that everybody's saying, you know, you can just flip a switch and then don't care about the legacy systems. I don't think that's what, uh, you know, Eric, please chime in here. I think that's what um, Eric and, and Sis are saying. I think what we need to think is that we need to have a holistic plan. We, we can't just say just because it's hard and I don't want to do anything. And so, you know, all the mitigations, which is what I believe is, you know, what you've got to put in place and the risk engines and things like all need to be in place, of course. But you, I think as an industry, not just federal agencies, but just as an industry, you know, we have to move. Everybody's got to move in, in, into, when there are new options available for authentication, we must all move there. Uh, and then start to remove the ones that are no longer able to meet the baseline. You know, for example, I think Eric mentioned about getting an OTP code on a phone like that. That's a very low bar for an attacker. It's, it really is. And so until we start to realize that that is not acceptable anymore, um, but again, it's not to just say, take it away and you've got no new options, right? So when there are new options, then we can reevaluate uh, based on new data and say, hey, should we even offer such capabilities anymore? So it's, it's definitely a journey. Uh, we definitely, from your book perspective, not, you know, trying to advocate everyone must switch to flip to do FIDO, but we have to do something now. We can't have less options, like say, take away, you know, SMS-based authentication, but then don't have something else. The good news is that we do have something else. Yeah, well said. Grant or Eric, does any of that resonate with you all or anything additional you'd like to add to the question? No, I think it was, I mean, it was a good good discussion. I think that, um, you know, the, the situation that large organizations like government agencies, large government agencies face is somewhat different from the situation that small organizations, whether government, you know, micro agencies or SMBs or some of the critical infrastructure providers face, there's a spectrum. Um, you know, we are trying to go for, you know, I think for organizations that face, you know, high threat actors, um, like pretty much all government agencies, um, you know, phishing resistance really is a bar that we have to, to, push, just to push for. Um, I certainly think that once you get outside of that area, um, you know, we're trying to encourage through policy, like allowing phishing resistance as an option, right? So part another part of M, um, 
2209 uh, encourages you know public facing or requires public facing systems to to offer it as an option in some cases um, if they currently support MFA and so that is um, you know a, another sort of lever that we're pushing on here but yeah no I mean I think overall I agree with the, the message so far. Great, thank you for your responses. Go ahead, Eric. Were you going to say something? Um, well, <clears throat> and yeah. So I mean, the, I think what I was going to raise the same section that Grant brought up. So the the, the zero trust strategy that we we published um, and that we and CISA are working on overseeing is ninety nine percent focused on the enterprise use case, like how people do work inside of an agency. But the one place where we um, imposed a requirement on public facing systems is around multi-factor and around phishing resistant MFA in particular, um, because we know that this is one of those areas where the way that enterprise technology works and consumer technology and, and logins work are, are interconnected, right? The, the, the patterns that people get used to, um, the technology that people have available to them in, you know, in their public life, it, it impacts what is acceptable inside the enterprise, the things that people are sort of trained and empowered to do at work, then impact what people are used to and, and, and grow accustomed to and becomes acceptable to do out in the public. And there's also in, in the particular case of um, FIDO-based authenticators, particular, they are designed actually to be reused across contexts. So while agencies might want to impose some requirements about what keys or devices can be used in their environment, um, anything that somebody gets for work, there's actually really no issue with them taking that token that they get or, you know, or whatever laptop or phone they might have and actually you, reusing that in a personal context, which is a little counterintuitive for a lot of, um, you know, enterprise IT situations, but is, you know, there, there really just isn't, isn't an issue there. So this is one of those things where I think we, we see change happening. This is really a national and, and the sort of global change that's happening. And enterprise IT needs to, in many ways, be the most strict, and why we're placing the strictest bar. And, and, and enterprises have more resources to bring their employees along with them and, and help get them to that place. Um, but it is, you know, we also want to make sure that the options are available and that the interoperability is present across those contexts. I just want to add a key, key service that the federal agencies have today that's public facing that has FIDO enabled is login.gov. So I mean it's like like this is being embraced in, in parts of uh, of federal service. You know, obviously I think more can be done, but you know, login.gov today has FIDO as an option to log in, which I, I use. <laughs> so it's it's exciting, right? So I think more services embracing it would allow again uh, for this uniform, more appropriate standard to flourish both from an end user as well as enterprise perspective. Excellent. Thank you guys. So we did have an audience question come through. If you're on the panel and you're able to see that, please go ahead and read through it. Otherwise, I'll read through it momentarily. But I want to pop up our second poll question before I do that. So could you please put that on the screen. Yeah, so can I can I actually take a crack? Oh, sorry, you want to do the poll before we go? No, go ahead, Grant. Okay. Um, folks at home, go ahead and just answer it. But Grant, go for it. Yeah, so I wanted to answer this question. Um, I mean, so again, it's it's optional at this point. We're asking you to offer it. Um, but I want to point out that um, platform authenticators are often overlooked in this space, right? We're not necessarily saying everyone has to have a little key that they plug into their computer. We're not saying that. The standard also works with the authenticator that is built into your pre-existing computer if you're using any of the major browsers on mobile or desktop. And that's a change in the last couple of years as this has been built into these, into these platforms. But a huge swath of the population um, doesn't know, but is able to register their laptop as a, a, um, you know, a, a platform authenticator. And so, you know, yes, they need to sign initially to their account one time. They, there needs to be some kind of a bootstrapping, like when they create their account or when they get a new computer or something like that. So it's not a complete solution, but for the problem of, you know, for certain threat activity, like stealing cookies, stealing passwords, phishing people's OTP codes, 
you know, a huge swath of that can be reduced by leveraging these capabilities. And um, a recent announcement from the FIDO Alliance, something called Passkey, solves one of the biggest remaining problems, which is the transfer of these things between devices, like when people get a new computer and things of that sort. And so I think there is um, there's a lot happening here that is going to render this issue of, oh, but, but, but I can't mail someone a key to be not a, as big a problem as it necessarily is perceived to be. There are plenty of use cases where the physical key is still important, um, absolutely. Um, but enabling this ecosystem is not limited to a physical key. Um, there's a number of other use cases, um, you know, ranging from touch your fingerprint in order to authorize a transaction, which is a very sort of common one that's well supported today by this infrastructure, to sign into an account after your cookies have expired to other kinds of things that, that are possible. So that's what I would say on that. Yeah, and just so I am clear, were you responding to the question in the Q&A box or in the chat? Question in the chat. Chat, got it. Okay, so for folks who can't see the chat, I'll just reiterate what the question is. How will Fed agencies scale FIDO availability for public users who are widespread and may not have technology available such as a smartphone, a laptop uh, with built-in FIDO readers? So that was the question that I was responding to. Eric, did you want to reply? Yeah, actually, there, there probably is a, a point adding. One, just to make sure that folks didn't take Grant's point and, and what I said before, that like for the public facing use case, we're not requiring the public to use phishing resistant MFA, but we're requiring agencies to make that available as an option so that users who do have that technology or need to apply that security bar for themselves can. The other thing, um, I would also actually point out that one of the technology, the technology monetization fund recently awarded some money to the Department of Veterans Affairs for a few different identity related efforts. One of them is actually that as veterans um, go, like there's, a, 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 I'll apologize, I may, I may butcher this a little as I, I'm not a veteran, I'm not intimately familiar with some of these processes, but um, when veterans come out of service and then become a veteran and they, they um, are, there's a part where they actually go to the Department of Veterans Affairs in person, um, and receive some login information to various veteran services that VA operates, that's actually what they're going to be doing is piloting uh, an initiative where they give FIDO compliant tokens to people, um, including people from all walks of, uh, you know, all walks of life, socioeconomic status, demographics, et cetera, um, and are, are gonna see what, what the effectiveness of that is as well and helping to, to raise some of the security for those people um, uh, because of course, sometimes it is the folks who um, are most vulnerable who they may lack access to, to technology, but also may be preyed upon through account takeover and other, and other issues. So that, I just wanted to point that out as, as an area also in the public facing space where the, the administration's making some investments in trying new things. Great, thank you. Any other comments before we move on? Okay, so then the next audience question that came through, I'll read it aloud. It's a little lengthy, so bear with me, but the US Access program has been in place for quite some time to support agency-wide PIV deployments across civilian government. Currently, the government does not have a centralized FIDO program that agencies can leverage to deploy FIDO at scale. Are there any plans in place to centralize a FIDO program? perhaps some consideration given into an off function under the CDM program? I think that's a question for me. Um, so the, the answer, I, so there's nothing to announce at this time, but I think it's a, 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 an excellent observation that, 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 that there is US access um, and it has provided a lot of you know, services to government agencies in, in terms of PKI and card issuance and things like that and that there's not a comparable um, effort ar around some of these things. So, so I would just say, I mean, I think, you know, we recognize that and, you know, we're continuing to look at what makes sense in terms of strategy, not just for, for, for the token, but the broader, you know, um, identity and access management space, right? Um, the other part of M2209 that we're not really talking about here is a desire to sort of up-level the technical maturity of the identity infrastructure as a whole. And a lot of the existing CDM efforts in the identity space have been focused either on privileged 
accounts or on like very specific things like the master user record and you know priv trust and and cred and and those are obviously important but they're not a complete ICAM solution by any stretch um and and there are you know places especially with the move to the cloud that's gathering steam in agencies where where I think it's clear that that more needs to be done so I don't I don't have any specific you know programs or initiatives to announce but I would just say this is an excellent observation and um you know yeah great thank you all right so moving right along Derek I want to hear from you next and my question is what is the importance of additional form factors for authentication beyond a traditional card form factor? Eric touched on a, a lot of uh, things earlier in that where, you know, even when you have like a specific uh, card authentication, uh, those can easily be, uh, you know, hacked, spoofed. Uh, if somebody gains access to an unpatched system, uh, somebody can basically uh, get your certs and basically pretend to be you uh, to log in. So. Uh, that's the importance of, you know, moving one step further and uh, and getting, you know, kind of moving to that passwordless um, multi-factor authentication uh, to where, you know, you're going to have, you're going to kind of get rid of what you know, then you're going to have uh, what you have. And I think uh, Grant was talking about, you know, a lot of them are going with biometrics. Uh, you got face uh, rec facial recognition. Uh, there, there's other forms of that. Think of like, perfect example, you go to the bank. Before you go to the bank, they would never ask you for your ID. And then after a while, people will be impersonating you. Okay, now they start asking you for your ID. Now what do they do? They take your picture. Um, so they're getting away from just, you know, accepting your signature. And now, you know, they've moved into their own form of, uh, you know, I guess kind of fishing resistant uh, multi-factor authentication, but they're making it a lot more harder uh, uh, for, you know, the criminals and, and attackers to come in. But that's just an example on the physical side. Uh, on the uh, cyber side, you know, it's, uh, it's more in depth than that when uh, people are trying to, you know, steal your identity and uh, and you know get into your systems and, and other means. But we've I've seen it on the DoD side a lot, uh, to where you know a CAC they're moving away from the common access cards uh, because you know people were able to, you know, spoof those and get the keys off or the certs off of those and uh, gain access uh, in encrypted uh, means uh, through email uh, or to various web pages or even onto systems that they have access with. So. Um, I think that's the importance of, you know, adding it to that. There's a lot more to it, which I know everybody else on the panel can get to. So I'll let them go. Well, thank you, Derek. And Eric, I know you mentioned some things earlier. Um, so is there anything else that you'd like to add or any of the other panelists? Okay. Oh, go ahead, Eric. The, just the high level remark that it's just really important that we um, be we just acknowledge that like people need options in order for this to for this to work like in real life people drop their cards in the ocean they they drop their phone in the toilet they change they just get a new phone right they they think things are refreshed all the time and and they just we, you know we live in a high entropy world so um a lot of the ways that agencies even agencies that may you know, be using PIV most of the time. It, the key word there is, is still most. There'll be corners of the agency that, that aren't, or there'll be clear use cases where that requirement drops instead of unexpected ways to provide some, some slack in the line. And I think what we are saying is that, you know, other form factors and protocols are needed so that the slack you need to provide in the line is actually just as secure as the line itself. I would like to add to what Eric said. But, you know, so the options are very critical. I mean, so one of the things that maybe not everybody knows about FIDO is it's really a self-registration type of protocol. It's really powerful because you can register more than one authenticator, right? So today, just issuing one CAC card, one PIF card is like a work. And the two, you know, like thinking about two is like a lot of work. Uh, FIDO, by nature of the protocol, is self allow for self registration, right? Which is a very critical piece for scale. Uh, what it means is that uh, if you give go through what Eric example, you know, so if you onboard a, a laptop, you onboard a phone, right? Like so, you can you can have more than one to get to the same. So you can register more than one authenticator. You can have a security key back up the phone, the phone back up the security key. They have all these combinations that allow for flexibility of, of usage. But more importantly, it, it doesn't change the baseline 
service requirement. Like the servers don't change just because you're multiple authenticators. You don't need to think of a bigger PKI setup or something. So by default, this is what this particular standard allows, which is very exciting. We don't have this type of protocol at scale um, previously. And the second point I want to make on the on the standard itself is uh, when we when we think about adoption, it's it's good to think through the different scenarios, obviously the assurance level. But we have one huge opportunity now, which is I, I think it's not fully addressed in this uh, conversation, but Grant brought it up, IAL, right? Uh, you know, the, there's this identity verification and then you have authenticator assurance. Like we need to think about binding this together because you, what you don't want to have is you create a very strong identification process, it's a big ceremony, and then you issue out a username and password, and then you onboard a FIDO credential. <laughs> Like the attack was just zoom into that process and just go to the middle layer and says, you know what, you issue a temporary password to get to the vital. So we need to think holistically. I think this is working on it. Grant, certainly you're working on that. Like we need to bind these things together so we don't drop an assurance level to go up again because that the drop is where the attackers are going to go. So I think uh, that's a big industry effort. It's non-trivial. It's non-trivial for enterprise as well as, you know, as a, and user's perspective, but we have to solve this binding problem. Uh, FIDO allows a huge lever that we can use. And now I think just trying to create policies and guidance about the binding, I think it's um, it's work to do. Uh, all of us need to do it, but it's it gives us the ability to do that now um, because it was quite hard to do without a FIDO sort of standard to do separate registration. In just to put a finer point on um, what Jared is saying, right? Like we're though in some ways we're talking about some, you know, raising a security bar, which can feel like a constriction. We're also talking about opening the door to using these different things. So you the best way to avoid ever having to drop down is to have all these options. It's very easy, you know, it is conceptually easy to imagine uh, a federal agency and an enterprise uh, putting their staff in a situation where the staff has, they have their PIP card, like they have all these things registered as ways to get into anything the agency operates. They have the PIV card that they can use to get in. They have their uh, their phone that they were issued or a BYOD device. They have their their, their government furnished equipment, their laptop, uh, whatever they may have, and, may, and maybe they have a portable token also that they were issued uh, upon uh, upon arrival or depending what the role is. You can you you might have people with four or five different devices that they're able to use to log into their things to do work without such that like, you know, even if they're, they don't have access to two or three of them, you know, for some pathological reason, even in that, in that extreme case, they still have ways to get in without having to go knock at IT's door and beg for an exception to get in and do their job. Excellent points. All right. So Jared, I want to ask you next kind of a big question. Is the federal government ready for FIDO? Eric thinks it is. <laughs> I, I, I certainly think it is. Um, industry has done it, right? So we, we're talking about coming from industry, building this thing, uh, commercial customers, enterprise customers have been already adopting this at quite a big scale. Uh, Grant, as, 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 as you've known, he came from Google. I mean, We've done this in industry. I, I think an industry has very similar legacy things. There's some, you know, you can think of different verticals that have these legacy pillars. Uh, and so I, I wouldn't say it's like a completely simple transformation. I mean, this is, I think, disruptive, you know, if you can think of it from an authentication perspective. Um, but in terms of the tech stack, it's mature. In terms of policy, I think, I think we're there from a maturity level. Implementation perspective, I think there's areas that we can improve because you know it's it's every unique vertical has its own set of challenges, but it's something that we've done before. So I, I believe that it is about um, kind of the will of of all of us to push this forward, and certainly you know people looking to Eric and Grant for leadership about how do we get it done, um, funding programs. You know those are the things that help accelerate it. Thoughts from any of the panelists? I mean, a few a few things. Um, you know, look, the PIV ecosystem is old and very mature and it does a number of things reasonably well. And there are certain things it, it just really can't do that are 
very difficult for challenges that we face that have led to a lot of this sort of not leveraging it to its full potential or, or thinking we're in maybe a better place than we are because of certain you know constraints like the lack of optionality that we've been talking about. Um, even things like drive pib, for example, you know, the way in which the drive pib actually gets bound to your mobile device leaves a lot to be desired from a cybersecurity point of view in some of the implementations. And so I think there are um, it's not from my point of view, it's 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 not maybe not the right question. It, 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 the right question is like, you know, how do we what is the best way to get to the cybersecurity goal that we need, which is phishing resistance? Uh, and what are the tools that we can leverage to get there? Um, I certainly agree that, especially in this space of binding accounts to credentials, um, there needs to be more maturity in the market. Um, there is a clear and well understood way to do that when you when your identity and your credential are kind of viewed as the same thing. I mean, that's not technically true with PIV anymore. It was true with PIV at the beginning. Now we started to decouple it because you had to to make the phones work. Um, but but there's still this sort of ambient collapsing of those that was a technical simplification that created a bunch of problems, but but it did make this piece easier. And so I think that's a that's a gap that needs to be solved, certainly in terms of I wouldn't say I think the policy is done. I think there's more to be done on the policy side. I think certainly in terms of programs and implementations, experimentation, there's a lot that needs to happen um, to, to make all to make us really be able to put a rest on uh, non MFA and pre um, you know non fishing resistant MFA, which is widely used. The the last thing I would say though is you know the legacy systems point. I mean, that's a problem with PIV too, right? It's not like people are using their PIV cards to connect to these legacy systems in many situations. At best, um, you know, they're they're connecting to some intermediate thing that with their either directly with their PIV or flowing through the rest of their identity using federation. Um, that federated model is exactly the same from an application point of view, regardless of if you're using PIV or another authenticator. So like we've introduced this indirection in the infrastructure, you know, with M1917 and frankly, with the way people had implemented PIV before M1917, at least in the civilian government, we had this indirection in place and we need to finish the job of, of actually doing that, of doing SSO, as opposed to just, you know, signing into the applications with passwords. And we need to make sure that the core identity infrastructure is something we can actually trust, right? In the in the old model of you know pre-zero trust, the identity infrastructure, we were still signing into applications, but in some sense, it wasn't the primary defensive boundary. In a zero trust world, it's not the primary, I mean, it is a critical defensive boundary. Um, and and I think that so 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 are we ready for FIDO? I mean, I don't know. Do I think that we need to figure out how to get to phishing resistance and that will require more options and tools? Yes. And that's sort of what we're trying to enable. This is going to be a journey for sure. Um, and yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Great questions and great feedback. So two more audience send-ins. One's more like a statement, but we can discuss that too. Pat Patricia Bates writes in, there are many partnerships and collaborative arrangements agencies are sharing data with .edu and other research and commercial entities. There should be a way to have FIDO creds to allow that to continue without dropping assurance levels to partners. Not sure how that could be funded. So that is uh, one comment from the audience. And then a question sent in by Jim Salmonson is, the complexity to centralize identity services for both legacy and modern applications is a continued struggle for agencies. Absolutely, FIDO options help accelerate the adoption for having options beyond PIV. Can CISA and OMB, can you guys provide guidance for agencies that are locked into PIV or nothing policies to embrace the future of FIDO and other options for MFA and zero trust needs with device validation. You want to take that one, Eric? Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, this is what we are um, 
you know, uh, Grant, myself, others inside OMB, CISA, uh, and as well as the National Cyber Director's Office. I mean, we are spending quite a bit of time with agencies right now um, and talking with them in depth about their existing policies, some of which are clearly, you know, to the commenter's point, PIV or nothing. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I do think from like a crisp policy perspective, you know, I, it, I, it feels like we have set a pretty clear sort of bar for what is expected, but we, we absolutely, we are engaging both like verbally as well as, as well as getting more into, into written stuff with agencies to really try and convey like the, the depth of the work that we know needs to be done to hit this bar. Um, we, we are absolutely talking with agencies and, and you know, sharing the viewpoint that we have all been kind of echoing here on this call today that, um, you know, we, we've all, we've had a, we've had a pivot or nothing policy in, in many ways across the federal government, formally or informally for quite a long time. And we still are where we are. Um, it's the, and we, we don't see a way, practical way forward for the government to hit, for any, any agency of any size to really incredibly achieve a strong enterprise-wide fishing resistant bar with a pivot or nothing policy. And so like we're, we're saying that increasingly directly, I think in settings like this, as well as to agencies. Um, and we, we welcome feedback on what we, you know, what else is helpful to, to, to get that message across. The other thing I would just say is, um, look, we need to prove that it can be done somewhere, like in order to sort of build momentum on this. I think there are pockets to what Derek said earlier, there are pockets of DOD that have sort of started to do really interesting things in this space. Um, at CISA as an agency, we're trying to do some interesting things. There are pockets in other agencies as well that are, are starting to explore this. Um, there are gaps in the market that, that are very government specific that need to be sort of fixed and that requires demand. So we have a bit of a first mover situation right now. Um, I think that you know, hopefully this cybersecurity environment, which is forcing us to sort of look at some of the slack, as Eric put it, that we created in order to, to, to let agencies' missions be executed and have to start to close some of those holes I think that will force a little bit of a reorientation in terms of, um, you know, tooling and strategies to approach that. Um, but yeah, I think this is a, as Eric has a phrase that I love, the government is a large multi-stakeholder tapestry. And I think that um, as we're trying to create additional space, on the one hand, we're trying to raise the security bar on the other, and, and we need help from everyone, you know, on this, on this you know, attendees and others, um, to sort of help you know work out some of these details and figure out how to really get to a phishing resistant future. I mean, PIV is a totally brilliant technology that was way ahead of its time. Um, and 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 I don't want this call to come off as anti-PIV. I mean, when I first sort of learned about it, you know, 10 years ago as an engineer, I was just, you know, I was incredibly impressed by what had gone into it, but we've learned certain you know issues with it that make it not a complete solution in the way that it was envisioned by its designers and so we need to complement it with other technologies in order to really get where we need to go so i think that's what i would say i mean coming from uh, the vendor world i, I think that uh, agencies should push your vendors i mean to, honestly i mean like why is it that a cms vendor cannot issue out fifth credential and final credentials like i mean like to me it's like the technology should make it difficult right so if everybody could if every issuance technology can issue a PIV, can then also do FIDO, then it helps all the agencies overall, right? So when, so the tech, the vendors have to evolve to meet the requirement. And I think that's also what Eric is saying and, and Grant, like, I think the tax tech should be easy. If the identity provider can issue and provide PIV and FIDO, then the work to do the transitional transformation is so much easier. Right. So I think that uh, all, all of the folks from the agency's perspective, I, I recommend to push your vendors, to, especially the IN vendors, to say, look, why, why is there, there FIDO on your roadmap? Or why is the FIDO support weak or whatever it is? I mean, I think especially those that have very invested PIV work streams, I, I don't think it's that difficult that FIDO, honestly. This, it's an open standard. There's so many implementations to implement that in, in the servers and the backend. Uh, I, I don't think anybody can say, oh, we don't, we don't have resources to implement FIDO. I, that shouldn't be the barrier. 
Thank you guys. So I'm gonna make a last call for questions since we only have 10 minutes left. If you have audience questions that you wanna answer, I'd send them in now in the next couple of minutes or so. And I'm also gonna ask for our third and final poll question to please come up on the screen. What is your agency's timeline for implementing phishing resistant MFA? So if you want your CPE credit for being here, please answer that. And with that, I'm going to ask my next question directed towards Derek. Derek, what are some practical steps that agencies should be taking to adopt and deploy phishing resistant MFA to meet required timelines? Yeah, I think what was said before, it's not going to happen overnight. This takes time. Some of it, you know, it's going to require funding. Um, but really, you just start with the basics of basically understanding first, what is multi-factor authentication? I know I said it earlier, but if you think of it in a simple term, more than a password, and then you move on to understanding um, what regs and stuff are out there right now, looking at the OMB um, 2209 or M2209, looking at NIST publications, they're out there as well. I think it's the 863 series, uh, 3A, they're all out there. Uh, and then also uh, maybe going to the FIDO uh, Alliance uh, page, looking at that, just doing research, educating yourself. So that's the first thing. You need to understand what you're implementing. Second thing is, what do you have in place already for authentication? If you can at least strengthen what you have right now, like I said, going back, a lot of uh, areas have, you know, forms of multi-factor authentication. But like I said, you look at the privileged users and you look at different ways of getting into the networks or on the systems. How can you strengthen that at the, you know, in the meantime? And then you have your plan of action saying, hey, okay, this is how we're going to implement, you know, these various uh, steps for phishing resistant. And, you know, like I said, it, it all stems down to training and awareness and, be, and educating yourself. Yeah, well said. Thank you. Would any of our other panelists like to respond to that? Start small. You can just get in there and start doing stuff, right? Uh, it, you know, um, if you really, if you start, if this is the sort of first time that you as an IT team have like really come across this technology, then you, you know, if I was a CIO, I'd be buying my, uh, my, my CIO team a whole bunch of these and telling them to go like start using them in your personal life, start, uh, you know, like find some systems internally where you can get, you know, where you, there, there may be some systems in your agency also that are partner facing or public facing could be appropriate for a login backup integration. Maybe you already have that done. And you can be using some of those things like even in, you know, in your work life. Um, and I think to Jared's point, right? Like you, you it's not, um, this is something that enterprise IT is all undergoing together, right? This is a bigger change than just the federal government. And uh, they're, they're you know, roadmaps are in all different places and it's it's got to be something where everybody is hearing the same message that like this this is this has to change. And then in fact, some of the things that we are used to doing, whether that's codes like we talked about or push notifications uh, the way that some, that some people have become used to getting in the enterprise that those that those don't hold up uh, against an, a, an attack and that it's just, it's time to, but you know, from a change management perspective, just it's more important to begin moving and start making changes than it is to gear up for a big bang, massive change two, three years from now. Excellent points, thank you. All right, well, with that, I wanna make sure we all have time to share some of our final thoughts. So I wanna go around and hear from each of you, what is the main takeaway that you have gotten from this conversation that you really hope even our audience members will walk away with a better understanding that you know this is what's very important to understand as it relates to the topic and everything we discussed. So Grant, do you think you could kick us off with that, with that um, portion of our webinar? Yeah, sure. Look, um, I mean, I think the big takeaway here is, um, you know, this is all very hard, right? We have we've been trying for um, a long time to to get to a fishing resistant future as a government. Um, and I think that, you know, we've realized that that we need more freedom to get there than than we originally had envisioned. Um, you know, freedom is not without cost. Um, but but I think there's a trade-off here that we've sort of collectively as a government community um, started to to sort of you know contemplate. And so I think you know change is hard, change is scary. Um, you know 
this is early days. And, and so I, I guess my, my main, uh, you know, takeaway and feedback is take a deep breath. It's, it's okay. We're going to work through this all together. And, um, you know, we, we have a really challenging problem to go out and solve together, but, um, but we have to figure out how to do it because, you know, the adversaries are not, are not sitting, sitting there silently. So that's what I guess I would say. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. We got this. All right, Eric, what's your takeaway? Well, I might've stole my own thunder there because I think the last comment I made about change management is, is, is one of the takeaways I want to, I want to leave for folks. I, I, maybe another, another aspect is just that um, it's just, it's very easy sometimes inside the U S government because it is, it is so enveloping. It is so large it, and, and it is a community. It's actually one of the things that surprised me when I joined the government was the, the sense of like community and shared experiences that people across agencies have. And, and that's really powerful and allows a lot of um, interagency collaboration to happen that wouldn't happen otherwise. It does also create a bit of a bubble. And um, you know what has been happening outside the federal government for a number of years are that um, industry, the security community broadly, which is, you know, which is not just industry, um, at, at the uh, significant parts of the enterprise IT field, we've all been moving in, you know, working to, and this is this is getting into the broader zero trust conversation, right? But like, and, and our, the model of enterprise IT itself is changing, and um, it's just we 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 cannot be a technology island inside the U.S. government. It's not sustainable. Um, we we should be using the tools and technologies that the rest of the world is using so that we benefit from the investments that are being made in those technologies. And so that also, and that, so that, also so that our interests are represented in the, in the further development of those technologies. Like this is something where we should be part of the global community on this. And I think that is, that is a, a part of what's happening. So even though this is, this in, to some corners of the government can feel like a new novel and somewhat disruptive thing, um, it is, this, it's, this has been a, a, a change that's been coming for a long time and is, is bigger than the U.S. government. Yeah, great. I've been hearing a lot about, you know, just collaboration with, with the global community. And Derek, let's hear from you next. Big takeaway, a lot of information, but the big thing is everybody on the panel here, resources. Uh, you can see there's just a few of us on the panel here, uh, Grant, Jared, Eric, uh, myself. Uh, you can reach out to anybody. You're not in a bubble. Uh, so, you know, if you ever have questions on, if you're confused on how to implement it, where do you go first? You just in this little footprint here, uh, you can always reach. Well, I mean, I know myself, you can. I'm pretty sure everybody else on here you can reach out to um, uh, in those regards. But yeah, uh, just looking at the SMEs on the panel here and uh, learning a lot of great information um, in their areas is uh, definitely super, very beneficial in that. So definitely don't, don't sit there behind the desk afraid to reach out. Um, but uh, that's what my big takeaway here. Yeah, that's great. Let's learn from one another. All right, and Jared. First, thanks everybody for joining us. I think the first step about um, what we're doing is that you want to learn uh, the step one. And so to Derek, echo Derek's point, I mean, the, the, the main takeaway is from my perspective is the education piece. So if anybody feels like this is overwhelming, and you need more resources to like get more and, and repeat. I think all of us are happy to share and, and educate because I think the education piece is quite missing overall and industry included. Uh, as Eric said, a lot of security folks are in a bubble. Uh, it, it shouldn't be that way. And this affects all of us every day, um, whatever we do inside, outside government, this is a big problem. And until we look at it as all of us has a part to play to solve this problem, then we're not going to get the scale we need. So thanks everybody for participating and, and wanting to learn. And we're all here continuing to evolve this for the good of uh, obviously federal agencies, but beyond that as well. Absolutely. So be open to learning and be open to educating. That's great. 
Well, thank you all so much for your time today, our panelists and our audience at home. We really appreciate you being a part of this collaborative session. I also wanna give a special thank you to Yubico for partnering with ATARC on this and making this happen. So um, again, I hope to see you all at our next one. I think we should be having a yet another poll up here. If you would like to have your CPE credit email to you, let us know so that we can get that out there for you. And also just know that our next event that's coming up is on June 28th. It is ATARC's 2022 AI and Data Virtual Summit. So if you enjoyed this program, I think you'll probably enjoy that content as well. You can go ahead and register for that on our website. And I hope to see you all there. Everyone have a great rest of your week. Thanks so Bye. much for having me. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye.